Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Versatile Biology, Engaging Experiments for Any Learning Environment, um, being co-hosted with AD Instruments and Vernier. In a moment here, I'll be going over uh, our agenda for today, which includes an introduction of your three presenters, uh, John Melville with Vernier, uh, Liam and Charlotte with AD Instruments. Go ahead and get started with that now. So today's agenda includes a quick poll, uh, just to gauge how familiar you are with uh, Vernier, LT, and AD Instruments products. Um, I'll introduce you to your presenters, and they will uh, give you an overview of the LT platform and the biology collection. So I'm going to launch the poll real quick. So it asks three different questions. The first one is, are you familiar with Vernier products? Um, are you familiar with LT or other AD Instruments products? And then we're curious to see what level you teach. Um, so I see the answers coming in now. And it looks like um, we have the majority of participants um, are not familiar with Vernier. It's almost a, almost a half split. Uh, most people are uh, familiar with LT or AD Instruments products. And then the most of our attendees are from that university college level with a few representing the community college and technical college uh, segments. So thank you for doing that poll for us. So I want to introduce you to your presenters for today. First up is going to be Liam Farley from AD Instruments. He has a master's in physiology. Uh, he helps uh, institutions in Australia and New Zealand achieve success with LT. And he is a former instructional designer in the AD Instruments content team. Next up is John Melville with Vernier. He has a BA in biology and psychology from Sonoma State University a PhD in zoology, a postdoctorate fellow from the University of Oregon, and he has been an associate prof professor of biology um, to majors and non-major courses in biology and neuroscience, and active learning with an emphasis on data collection and inquiry. And last but not least, uh, this is Charlotte with AD Instruments. She's an instructional, instructional designer on the LT content team. She managed development and recent release of the LT Biology Collection, which she'll be talking about further detail uh, during the session today. And her aim in developing the collection was to draw on four competencies for undergraduate biology students, Bloom's taxonomy, and opportunities for exploring the nature of science. So I'm going to pass it on to Leo. Yes, Angie. All right. So I just wanted to give uh, a wider context of LT and how it situates before handing over to John and Charlotte to delve more into the biology collection itself. Uh, so yeah, just uh, trying to relate it to the existing tools that you might be using um, within your institutes. And I assume being educators, uh, the primary tool that you're using is likely to be a learning management system or LMS, such as Blackboard, Canvas, or Moodle. And so how LT relates to LMSs is it's not an LMS. It's not trying to compete with LMSs. Um, so it's trying to play nicely and work alongside um, LMSs. And how it's differentiating is uh, a couple of different factors. One is, as you'll see shortly when I log in, uh, LT is a nice, clean um, environment that really reduces that cognitive load for the students. So they're not seeing all these notifications that are coming in and being distracted by their other um, course material. They can really burrow down and focus just on a particular um, lesson at one time. Um, and there's also the data acquisition side of LT, which uh, John will delve into um, more deeply. So students can actually record um, the data directly into LT. LT itself, uh, like many tools now, is simply a website, a very powerful website. Um, 
but that gives a lot of flexibility to LT because students can access it from anywhere that um, has uh, reception um, and a device that can access internet. Um, so that includes mobile devices. So students can be last minute frantically doing any pre-lab um, preparation on the bus on the way to campus. Um, but it also allows students to be uh, working in a uh, lab together as well. And that's where I'm wanting to focus on um, initially is that you can see there's two uh, types of login when you first come onto the LT website. And so you've yeah, got single login and group login. Um, and again, that's just highlighting that students can all be on the same computer in the lab, working away, getting um, just that perfect data. And then they can sign out and individually at home, they can be coming on and completing that lab, um, answering questions that maybe you want them to answer individually. So you know that, uh, yeah, it's not the strongest in the group, maybe carrying um, maybe the less strong. So anyway, I'll delve into LT. Um, I won't bore you with uh, trying to remember my password or awkwardly trying to type in front of um, people, which never seems to work. So now that I'm logged in, uh, you can see what LT looks like from the student's perspective, where you can see all the courses available to them on the left um, and all the content um, within an individual course. So you can be clicking through um, and seeing the different options. So, I'm just going to jump into uh, an example lesson. I uh, should point out that I'm actually signed in as an educator, and so I'm able to preview the lesson. Um, students wouldn't see that. So jumping into the lesson environment, you can start to get an idea of yeah, how LT is starting to yeah, differentiate from um, LMS, because one, it's yeah, very nice and clean, and you can see how it's blending uh, simple text images, um, but you can also get elements such as pop-ups that you can interact with. So if you're wanting to give a definition for a term, um, you can then kind of tuck that away in a pop-up um, so you can save the real estate um, for more important information. And the way LT lessons are set up, they're uh, a progressive uh, linear series of pages that are theoretically infinitely scrollable, but obviously you want to not have um, students scrolling for too long. And you can add uh, many different types of content yourself um, to LT. So that's something I'll show shortly is how you can actually author content in LT or adapt existing content such as the biology collection. So students can be interacting uh, with different uh, question types. They can be checking their answers, getting feedback. Uh, there's many different types of um, questions. So upload and annotate, uh, drag and drop is a very common theme in LT. Um, as well as yeah, more simple table-like questions. So I won't bore you going through this um, lesson, but I'll just quickly jump to the end and show that uh, students are able to uh, commit the lesson. Uh, they can even download a report of all the questions in the lesson. And there is a grading option as well if you do want to be doing assessments in LT. So I'm going to jump into another area where I can kind of show you from the uh, admin or educated perspective what you're seeing. So you can have your course, um, you can see all the options here, and I won't bore you with the um, more admin side of stuff, I'll show you the authoring aspect. So you can see what um, lessons you have in that course, you can create a new one, and you can also utilize uh, the extensive uh, range of content that ADI has developed from our content library. So the one of interest today is going to be the biology collection, but there's many other um, collections as well in different languages and it's very easy to go through see a lesson or a lab that might be of interest and you can click import and it'll yeah, download it into your course and so once you've got the lesson in your course you can open it up and make any tweaks that you want so what we're really trying to do is yeah develop content that you're able to use straight out of the box if it fits your needs. But I imagine there's always going to be those little tweaks just to adapt the content um, to fit to your particular curriculum. And so as an author, when you come into the, um, the lesson itself, you'll see there's the option to edit. And so when you click that, uh, you'll see the authoring tools. And these have been designed to be as simple and as intuitive as possible. And it's based on uh, what says what you get, or WYSIWYG um, approach. So any changes you make um, in the authoring environments essentially is what the students will see. Um, and thankfully, because it's all uh, adaptive, 
that you just create it once and you um, don't have to worry about creating a mobile specific version um, or a desktop specific version. And the basic elements within a lesson are what are called panels. And so you can click around and see what panels have been created already. And these can simply be clicked and dragged around if you want to reorder. So you don't have to worry about you know pressing space bar you know ten times to get that perfect alignment. You can just drag it across um, and then tweak as needed. So everything adapts around. So I've made this look um, far worse than what it was, but that's starting to give you an idea of yeah how quickly you can be um, authoring content. If you want to be adding new content, you can go under the panels library, and you can just drag on any element that you want. Say for example, you had a Away. an image sitting on your desktop, um, you can actually drag that straight on um, and yeah, it'll create a panel straight away. So very quickly you can be bringing in um, elements from outside of LT into LT um, because I imagine there's a lot of existing resources that you want to repurpose and so yeah with LT you can quickly drag that on um, and yeah, create lesson as you need. So I mentioned, yeah, there's probably a few people that already know about LT and I don't want to be, you know, explaining uh, what you already know. That's probably going to be enough um, for the moment. But if you do have any questions um, or areas of LT that you maybe want us to explore more in depth as we go through this webinar, by all means, uh, put it in the chat or in the Q&A and we can either uh, respond to you individually or maybe we can jump back on and um, screen share at a later stage. Uh, just to point out how you actually can uh, trial LT. Uh, simply you can go to adinstruments.com forward slash LT and you'll see there's this free trial option or you can just google LT AD Instruments. It's like to be the first one at the top um, and then yeah you can get your own free trial um, and play around yourself um, to really feel if LT is yeah, going to be what you're after. Uh, so with that I'll be handing over to John. Hello, so what, what I want to do next is I want to talk about what the LT Biology Collection is, and then I want to explain a little bit about what Charlotte and I are going to be talking to you about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to review two slides, and then I'm going to share my screen and show you what I'm talking about in these two slides. So the LT Biology Collection was developed in collaboration with um, Vernier and AD Instruments. Uh, we make probes, predominantly probe software and textbooks. And the LT environment is just amazing because it, it has amazingly rich content as Liam just showed you. So we were really excited because we realized that we could take our sensors and port it into the LT content using some of the content from our textbooks or our lab books that we developed. But Charlotte and the content team just did an amazing job at even expanding the content that we had to make it just above and beyond what you could find normally. And that's why it's, it's, a, it's an amazing platform to use um, in multiple levels. So the, the biology course or the LT content in the biology collection consists of 19 ready-made labs. Um, those are fundamental to basic introductory biology. Um, they integrate with a Vernier GoDirect sensors. This is a Vernier GoDirect sensor. They have this light blue on them. They um, have both Bluetooth and a USB port on them. Um, in LT, you would need to use them with the USB port. So you would plug them into your computer and use over USB. Um, what's also really amazing though, is that the LT platform is suitable for remote learning environments because it has built in example data. So there is a way to load in to LT sample data from all of those experiments. And once again, that was also developed in collaboration with Vernier and AD Instruments. So if your students are working remotely, they can use LT, they can load in the sample data and they can do a lab. If they're in person, they can also collect data directly. So it's a very unique environment in that it supports both learning platforms, both direct data collection and then remote data collection with sample data or even just analyzing sample data sets. I'm gonna wind up showing you two labs, cellular respiration and enzyme action. I'm gonna collect data with cellular respiration and then I'm gonna show you the sample data in the other lab. But I still want to remind you that LT has incredibly rich content. It's fully editable, it is expandable, and it has extensions, it supports inquiry, 
and even has lab reports in it. So it really was developed um, for, there are guided inquiry extensions that promote learning. And that's a really unique thing about the LT platform. It's also aligned with core competencies that are informed by vision and change. And it also was developed uh, with the assessment of Bloom's taxonomy, which is also unique. And they've also done a really great job, the content team, of making sure that students are exposed to real world applications and concepts, and they add a lot more information into the activities. What I mean by that is I've, I view LT as sort of like what I always wanted. It's kind of like a lab textbook or a lab book that integrates the data collection, everything in it on the web. But maybe I should just stop talking and actually um, show you what it looks like. So let me go to a screen share. Let me share my screen. And here we go, hold on. <clears throat> so I'm on the AD Instruments webpage right now. And I just wanna show you that on the LT webpage, there's this little spot right here, the lab chart, power lab and LT. And if you tap on LT, it's going to take you to that same page that um, Liam was talking about. And these are all the collections in the LT platform. And if you scroll down, there's this great one here called biology and we can take a look inside of it. <clears throat> and there's this great video. So if you ever wanna come back to the ADI website and just review everything that we're talking about today, this little one minute video, one minute video is great. It covers the core concepts, what's involved in it, how it can work. It's a great video that they put together. This website is actually a great place to go to review how LT works. Um, and we'll talk about how you can preview it or get a free trial, free trial later as well. Now, if you look down below, once again, there are these 19 interactive biology activities and all of them or lots of them support use of the sensor. So if I expand acid rain, like Liam showed us, you can see that there's an introduction to it. And then if you scroll down below, it'll tell you what sensor it supports. So in this case, it supports our GoDirect pH sensor, and then it'll tell you how to purchase those GoDirect sensors if you're interested. And that is available for all of the labs that are in the entire collection. All right, so what does LT look like though on the inside? I wanna take you to the biology collection. So I have my own account. So in this case, I'm logged in to the biology collection. This is my course that I've developed. Right now with this little key, you can see that I'm logged in as an administrator. I also, I also have an account where I can log as in a student. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like if you're a student using the collection. But if you look in the, the, um, this collection, I have loaded up all of the lessons. So you can see down below here, there's acid rain, animal behavior, um, bacterial transformation. There's all the labs I've loaded up into, um, into my course, but I've only published some and those are the ones that I want to show to students. So if I actually look at published, you can see these are the activities that I've decided to share. So you can do the same thing. You can pick what lessons you want to publish, when you want to publish them in your course, et cetera. There is a whole other side of how to manage your course, um, show labs, student work, student accounts, staff accounts that we're not gonna cover, but it's amazing that it does all of this. So <clears throat> let's just take a look at the cellular respiration lab. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over to being a student and then I'm going to click on the cellular respiration activity. Now what it says up at the top right away is that this student is in a, lesson, is in a preview mode and I'm just gonna start the lesson. And it's gonna say, hey, do you wanna start by yourself? Like you might be a group leader working in a group. So it gives you that option. I'm just gonna say start by myself. The lab itself, all of the parts you can find up top, there's all of these parts. So I'm gonna take you through those, the challenge, materials and setup, data collection and analysis, review and integration, and then I'll go on to the next lab. But you can look at all of the components of the lab by looking at this drop down up here. What's really great, like once again, that I said about these labs is that they have, they're really, they have really rich context and pictures, and they actually have hyperlinks to like, well, what is glucose? What are heterotrophs? 
um, great images. <clears throat> they really even scaffold well how everything works. So this is an introduction into what are the steps in cellular respiration. There's glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation, decarboxylation, citric, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. And then it even defines those. So it gives the students lots of great information that they can review before they begin the activity. In a lot of textbooks the, or lab books, it's really just do this, see the results, analyze, and then the students go back to their textbook. In this case, it's really almost all integrated and uh, it's just done really well. There's also a challenge before you begin to collect data. So if we take a look at the information before, the students are asked to actually read and understand this process. They can look down here at all of these parts. What, are, what is oxidative phosphorylation? What is a citric acid cycle? And then we even have the learning objectives and it tells them what they're going to do. We're going to measure uh, the rate of cellular respiration. And then here are the learning objectives down here. But before they do that, they're going to, they have a challenge, which is, okay, do you understand what you're doing before you begin? So in this lab, it says you will measure CO2, which is produced by cellular respiration, which steps of this process release CO2? Well, if you remember, if you looked on the previous page, it tells us what those are, but you can imagine the student might just, you know, just throw some in here, but then you can actually have them check their answer. Wow, I, that was a great guess. Got them all perfect at that, that time. I guess I was a biology instructor at some point. Um, Another great thing about these labs is the content team has done a great job at putting in what I call key questions that a lot of teachers, um, <clears throat> that a lot of students come across as misconceptions. So my biggest misconception when I used to teach introductory biology was my students would always think that plants didn't have mitochondria. They would think that plants can't do cellular respiration. Of course they can. Their cellular respiration that plants do and photosynthesis. So this is a great question. It says cellular respiration occurs in heterotrophic organisms. Plants are able to use a combination of photosynthesis and cell respiration to meet their needs. Photosynthesis requires light energy. So when does cellular res respiration occur in plants? Well, I would say it occurs all the time, daytime and nighttime. But right here in this question, it begins to address that key issue that a lot of students have is they just assume that, you know, mitochondria don't exist in plants. Then it asks them to formulate a prediction. What do we think is gonna happen if we're looking at um, germination, cell respiration? And then after that, we go on into the data collection. So there's a lot of setup before we go into actually how to do the lab. But they have this great view of here's the equipment that you'll need, a go direct CO2 sensor, a 100 mil beaker, 250 mil respiration chamber, um, and some consumables. I'm only gonna do one part of this activity. I'm just gonna be looking at uh, cellular respiration. I'm not gonna do non-germinating. We're not gonna cool them down because it would take too long. I just wanna show you how it works. But in the setup procedure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my CO2 gas sensor. I'm gonna plug in the USB cable. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna to go to the next page and we're gonna look at the effect of germination. What I'm gonna do next is I wanna show you a little bit closer what this all looks like. So I'm gonna minimize this a little bit. And what you can see here, I'm using this uh, program called IPEVO Visualizer, but it allows me to display both um, using a little, little camera, the respiration chamber, the PEs and the CO2 gas sensor. And then we'll go back and take a look at the data here in a minute. So I'm gonna take 20 PEs or 25 Ps. It's not super critical for this activity, but we tell you to, to take 25 Ps. So I'm just gonna take a small handful because I wanna demonstrate this. I'm gonna just blot them dry. So these are Ps that are, um, we've put in water. I've let them sit for about a day. This would work even in just like a, an hour or so. This is a very classic lab activity. So these seeds are beginning to germinate. Um, and in a few more days, they would actually sprout. You would see their roots um, form and, and little leaves come out. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna transfer these peas 
Hopefully, yes. There we go. Do this uh, Nalgene bottle. Now, one of the one of our key little tricks is that CO2 is also there. So I'm going to put it on its side, but it would also work if you tilted it upright. I'm going to use the, the top of the CO2 of the respiration chamber just to balance it here a little bit. So it stays nice and still. There we go. And I'm just going to wait a little bit for the CO2 levels to equilibrate before I hit uh, collect data. Um, but what we can do is I can go back over here and we can begin to collect some data. Now I'm not going to collect data for a whole 10 minutes, but I'm going to collect it for a short period of time. So I'm going to hit collect. It's collecting data. One of the things about CO2 is that you, in a lot of cases, you might want to zoom in to see that it's increasing, but I'm just going to wait here for a little bit. But I can use these panels here to zoom in on the scale and zoom out, and then scroll up. If I keep doing that. Uh, you can see that it's actually already increasing. So that's one of the really nice things about uh, the CO2 measuring cellular respiration photosynthesis is CO2 changes very quickly. Um, there's very low amounts in the atmosphere. So you can see it's already going up. So I'm just going to let it go, keep going there. We'll see what happens after a, a minute or two. And then I'll show you how, to, how we analyze it. Any questions so far? I mean, all that I've done is I've just taken this Vernier uh, go direct CO2 gas sensor. I plugged it in over the USB cable. I plugged it into my computer, put some P's in there, and I hit collect. And I'm collecting data. And um, looks actually quite good so far. So we could conclude, right, that the CO2 is being released by those P's. So this plant, these plant seeds, are performing cellular respiration. Let's go for a little bit longer and then I'll show you how to analyze that data. Oh, I can put in a comment. I, I could say, oh yeah, these are germinating. Let's add that comment. So there's a way to actually add comments while you're collecting data so that if you're collecting multiple runs of data, you students could actually mark what's germinating, what's not germinating. And that's really important later when you're actually going to be comparing things like enzyme action and thing like, things like that or looking at substrate concentration. So I think that's a lot, enough. Let's hit stop. And I can um, auto scale this data. Oh, there we go. It's nice. Zoom out a little bit. Oh, let's zoom out time base here. Think, go out. There we go. Scroll down here. All right. So what I'm going to do then is go to the next uh, page where we actually analyze this data. So I'll go to the next page. And let's get rid of the, I don't think we need to look at the peas germinating there anymore. So let's expand that out. So that'll be easier for us all to see. And what I can do now is if I auto scale again, let's zoom out here a little bit. Or zoom in a little bit, there we go. I can scroll back to the beginning. And for the analysis, what's great is LT tells you how to do all of this. So it actually tells you, use the compression bars and the scroll bar, locate the comet germinating, which I have right here, drag the marker to the start of the recording. The marker is right here. I'm gonna drag that to the very beginning of the recording. Then I'm gonna place the point selector, um, which is here on the graph. Let me maximize this really quick. So I'm gonna drag it to the end. And then if you look down here, I have the change in CO2. 
and I have the change in time. So I can drag that over and I can drop it in this column and I can drop it in here. And that winds up creating a plot down below. Now let's, I don't wanna take the time to collect the next set of data for non-germinating peas. It's basically a flat line. It's not very interesting. I can just fill it in though. I can say that, oh, we saw a change in 20 over 120 seconds. And if we scroll down, you can see that that graph is actually created. And what's great is I can actually label this graph. I can edit it and I can say cellular respiration or and there's other tools that I can use to label it. I can label the X axis and Y axis. So I can label this axis. I can say this is CO2 or I could say uh, respiration rate. I haven't put in proper units, but I could put in units if I wanted to. And then I could put in here uh, condition. All right, so I'm looking, in this case, I'm looking at germinating and non-germinating peas. And you can see there looks to be a very significant difference in the respiration rate. And then next, there's a, we come back and you test the understanding of the students. Did you understand what you did? Um, you know, what's your prediction? What's your conclusion? Based on your results, can you draw a conclusion? Do, do non-germinating peas perform cellular respiration? I, no, I, I, we don't have evidence for that. Um, and then there's a follow-up activity. So a lot of these activities in LT are more than just one simple activity. They build on each other. And I just wanted to remind you, they're fully editable. You don't have to do all of them, but you can expand on them. So then the next experiment would be looking at the effective temperature. All right, so let's, let's stop and let's go back and look at a different activity and use the sample data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at enzyme action. So the other activity that's really popular is enzyme action. Um, in this lab, what you do is you take a look at, use an oxygen gas sensor, and then you could use yeast or a catalase enzyme and you mix it with hydrogen peroxide. And you can look at um, the generation of oxygen gas and actually do a bunch of enzymatic analysis with it. It's a very popular lab, it works really, really well. Um, but what I wanna show you is how to get access to the sample data in this activity. So if I select start lesson, once again, I'm gonna hit start by myself. Like all of these activities, it has a great introduction where it talks about what an enzyme is. It goes through the learning objectives. It has a challenge and th this is a great challenge. They, they designed this themselves where they actually have a diagram of an enzyme and you have to pick like, well, what's the active site? Uh, where is the enzyme? I'm getting these mixed up, right? I think the active site is actually this location. Well, actually, right, hold on. I'm just going to throw them around there. The enzyme complex. Oh, wait, there we go. Enzyme substrate complex. Products. So I'll just toss these in here. Right, and it says I got these two right. They can go back and double check. This, of course, is the... Is the um, the enzyme, this is the substrate, et cetera. Once again, it asks them to formulate a prediction. So the, the format is very similar. And then there's the material uh, setup and the setup procedure. In this case, it shows says to use an oxygen gas sensor. All right, but let's say that your students are working remotely. They've gone through this and they don't have an oxygen gas sensor to use. Well, you can set up LT so that they can actually activate the sample data sets by just entering a code. So I'm gonna hit shift start, use sample data. I know the code. And the sample data is going to just appear. And then I can increase here. And so now I can begin to do analysis of one drop, two drops, four drops to look at the effect of enzyme concentration. So if I go to the next slide here, I can do the same kind of analysis where I can expand. 
and I can, you know, drop the marker, drop this here, and then I can drop these into a table. And I can begin to do that for each each set. So what about two drops? Okay, let's take a look at two drops. I can drop the marker. Let's look at the last one. Once again, the marker, drop the marker. Drop it down into the table. And once again, it's going to create a graph and we can see that we have this really nice linear fit, which is um, enzyme action. I could even edit that graph. I can do a curve fit, do a linear curve fit if I wanted. I could label it. Here's the fit equation down below. And once again, it's going to test our understanding and ask lots of questions. Um, so what I think I need to do is I want to move forward because there's a lot more that's actually in all of these activities. So there's another activity in this enzyme activity where you look at the effect of substrate concentration. And once again, there is also sample data. So if I hit shift start, I can say use sample data, type in the code, and there's the sample data for this part of the activity. And I could go through and analyze that once again, just like I did with you previously here. But what's really great is in addition to looking at the effect of substrate concentration, and what I wanna move on to is all of the added activities that are in here. So in most cases, if I was teaching introductory biology, I'd probably pretty much stop here at the effect of substrate concentration. But in these activities, there's also, we can look at enzyme kinetics. So we can look at Vmax, half Vmax. So this is an almost an extension that you can look at. Um, and we could actually do a line weaver Burke plot. In addition, at the end of the lab, there's review and integration. So you, there's questions that you can ask. Um, so we come full circle back to what, was, what the activity was about. Do you understand it? And then what I wanna move on to is all of the extra features that are in here. So there's experimental design questions, there's inquiry, and there's is also even the ability to do a lab report. So with that, I would like to pass this on to Charlotte because she did a tremendous amount of the work in the biology collection and it was wonderful working with her on this on all of these extensions and how they're uh, related. All right, thank you, John. Um, hi, everybody. It's great to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen on the same page that John left off from. Um, so this is the extension activity for the Enzyme Action Lab. Uh, I was involved with the management and development of the biology collection. Uh, what we wanted to do with the biology collection was to offer flexibility to educators and students. So that's what we've tried to capture with these extension activities. So not all of the labs in the collection have extensions, but a number of them do. And we've aimed to include them for educators who may have students at different levels of ability within their classes, or for educators who might have varying uh, lab session times. For one week, it might be short, the other, it might be long. So because the labs are fully editable, you can add or remove this um, experimental design page um, according to your needs, essentially. So in the extension activities, um, we want to expose students to inquiry and to the process of science. So we're trying to move away from cookbook laboratory activities. And so here, generally students will use the same uh, sensor as was used in the base activity in the lab. And then they get to investigate a research question of their own choice. And it always relates back to the key concept that they're learning about in the lab. So they follow a stereotyped structure so we have uh, a list of materials. So generally this will be the same list of materials as in the base lab, but sometimes there'll be some additional materials to expand the field that the students can explore. And we give them an appropriate safety warning. So we'll always list out um, the chemicals that they use and um, the danger associated with that chemical. 
So we know for educators that it might be a little unwieldy if you have a class of 20, 30, 50 students all investigating something different. So uh, we decided to move away from entirely free inquiry and instead offer uh, students a guided inquiry activity. So here you have uh, the security of knowing what your students are going to investigate and you know that you can support them in that. So here students can choose a question. Here I'll choose how does pH affect catalase activity. And then we start to support students through uh, the process of designing an experiment. So they need to learn about variables, independent and dependent. They need to learn about ranges. So here, if we look at this pop-up, we give them some examples of choosing um, a range for their variable that they're looking at. They have to learn about controls and they need to learn about sampling frequency. Uh, we also get them to look at parameters. So, so here they have to actually think about those parameters in relation to the question that they've chosen. And they have to make a prediction, which is a key facet of authentic scientific inquiry. And they need to explain that prediction. They can't just pull it out of thin air. And then we ask them to come up with a method. So how do they think, knowing that they have a research uh, question, how will they address that question? And then we move into uh, data collection. So this is a stereotype structure across the labs. Generally, we will have a design page and then a data collection page. So the procedure will be aliased across from uh, the page before. And then in the data collection panel, uh, it will have settings files set up so that they can record data with the sensor that they're using in the lab. And then as John has shown you uh, in other labs, we have interactive panels. So these panels here will show uh, data readouts from that, from the collected data. And then they can edit this table. So I might just um, enter some nonsensical values in here to give you a sense of what's going on. And then we see a graph down here. And because we want students to have a bit more um, autonomy and ownership over their data, um, we want them to be able to edit the graphs. So we make the graphs editable and they can choose what the graph is going to be and they can look at different curve fits. And then we need them to make a conclusion. So looking at your prediction, what has happened in your experiment and do your results actually support your prediction and why or why not, why do you think that's the case? And then finally, um, we always conclude extensions with a test your understanding section. So we want to get students at higher cognitive uh, skill levels. So in this case, we've asked students to examine another student's data. Uh, this is really handy if students are at home uh, and they're not necessarily in a teamwork environment, but you still want them to uh, develop the skill of critiquing another person's data. And then here we've related the key concept of the lab back to human physiology. And we like to provide uh, relevant facts about day-to-day -day life. So here in this day-to-day, -day, um, here in this pop-up, we're talking about enzymes and cooking and about how lemon juice can cook fish without heat. Another key feature of our labs, um, and indeed you find these lab reports in the extensions, but we found them to be so valuable that we've put them in almost all of the biology labs, are these lab report pages. So communication is really important uh, for students, even at the undergraduate level or especially at the undergraduate level. And so here we have a stereotype template uh, teaching students how to write a lab report. So we guide them through coming up with a title. Uh, they need to record who worked on the experiment. In the introduction, they have to describe the purpose of the experiment. They have to talk about what enzymes are and how they function and they need to talk about their research question and prediction. And then we scaffold them through their methods, their results, the conclusion, and their references and appendix. So students can go back to their prediction, and be reminded of that, and their procedure will be aliased here so they can write about their methods. They can upload photographs of their experimental setup if they were actually in the lab. And at the end, references and appendix. So we want students, where possible, to interact with the literature. Uh, and so here they would cite their references. Um, Angie, if you would take me back to the main slides, I just wanted to talk to a couple of the points on those slides. So uh, I wanted to talk about a couple of the features that we use to scaffold the labs. Uh, 
So when we first began collaborating with Vernier in 2019, uh, we were looking around for resources that we could use to, to scaffold the labs and increase their pedagogical rigor. So uh, some of you may be familiar with a report that was published by the Academy, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, excuse me, um, called Vision and Change, a call to action. And that was published in 2011, and it essentially surveyed the state of undergraduate biology education in North America. Uh, and it found some things to be lacking. One of the uh, main things that it recommended was that students be exposed to the authentic scientific method, which is what we have tried to uh, move towards with our, um, with our extension activities. Uh, and the report also outlined five core concepts and six core competencies for undergraduate biology students. Uh, and the core competencies were what we really latched onto and what we used to build our labs. Uh, we, every assessment question that we wrote in these labs, where possible, we tagged it against a core competency. Um, these include the process of science, so the getting students familiar with the iterative nature of science, uh, there's a possibility of going wrong, uh, interacting with the literature, coming up with research questions, making hypotheses, um, quantitative reasoning. So in these labs, you are able to collect uh, numerical data with the census, and we also provide example data, and students need to be able to manip manipulate that data uh, and use numerical or quantitative reasoning uh, to work with it. Modelling was another competency, and the interdisciplinary na nature of science. So what we always try to do is start a lab off with a narrative hook. So here we're trying to relate the key concept of the lab to uh, a real-life scenario that the student might resonate with. Uh, and in this way, we want to increase student engagement and therefore increase their motivation to work through the lab. And this also relates to another core competency, which was science and society. So we're thinking about the ethical implications of science and how working as a scientist, you affect your world. And also communication and collaboration. So you'll see in that lab report that I, would, that I walked you through um, that we've built communication into every lab through those lab reports. Another feature that we used uh, was Bloom's Taxonomy. So Bloom's Taxonomy, um, you may be familiar with, uh, it was established by Benjamin Bloom in the 1950s. And it's essentially um, a pyramid of cognitive skills. So it's a way of um, ranking cognitive skills. You can visualize Bloom's Taxonomy as a triangle. And so the base level is uh, the most basic cognitive skill, which is remembering. Then you move to understanding, then to applying, analyzing and then evaluating and creating. So every question that we wrote in these labs is tagged um, to a Bloom's taxonomy level. And we also tried to scaffold the overall structure of the labs to Bloom's taxonomy. So you'll remember that John showed you some challenge pages. Uh, we try to include questions at the basic level, remembering and understanding on challenge pages. As we move through the activities, we're thinking about students applying, for example, equations and analyzing data and working out the relationships between components within a system. And then at the review and integration page, where we're trying to tie everything together, we're thinking about uh, evaluation. So you remember I showed you a question where the students have to evaluate another student's data. Uh, and creation, so in extensions where they design their own experiments, they're creating something new. Um, and I've already talked about students being exposed to real world applications. So we're thinking about those fun facts that we include and the narrative hooks. If I take the share screen now, and I'm conscious that we just have a few more minutes, I wanted to talk to you about some distance learning um, features that we have. So uh, some labs have two versions. All labs have example data in them that can be accessed, but some labs like this one, mitosis and meiosis, has a specific uh, distance learning lab version. So mitosis and meiosis is a key topic um, in first year biology. And I just wanted to show you what I'm quite proud of, which is um, our mitosis observation section, uh, where you can look at histology. So we didn't want students to be um, necessarily restricted by the fact that they didn't have access to a microscope if they were stuck at home. So here we include um, histological images, microscopic images, uh, in what we call our hotspot panel, where students can interact with pins uh, and find out more about what's in the image. And then they can also answer questions about that image. And we include uh, pictures of different stages of mitosis and students can interact with those images. Another way of interacting with images in this lab is the annotate panel. So here we ask students to do a cell count so they can identify uh, cells at different stages in mitosis and count them up. And then they're able to create a graph 
uh, based on that cell count. And finally, knowing that it is uh, 10 to, um, I wanted to show you the Population Genetics and Evolution Lab. So um, this was a really fun lab for us to work on. In the lab, um, in the physical environment, students would use a card-based activity to look at allele frequencies, uh, the effect of natural selection and genetic drift. But one really engaging feature of this lab is the case study. Uh, so we look at how disease affects allele frequencies. And the specific case we look at is sickle cell anemia. So students um, working through our interactive panels, they can look at the pathology of the disease, uh, they can predict the frequency, how the frequency of an allele might change over time. They can look at clinical data and try and match a phenotype to a genotype. And then further on down here, um, this is the hotspot panel again, but it's been used in a different way. So here we've created a fictional scenario and students can interact with this map of an island and find clinical data uh, at each point in that island. And then they interact with that data to come up with genotype counts and allele frequencies across the island. So um, Angie, if you just take me back to the main slides, please. Uh, it's been really great having the opportunity to talk to you all about the biology collection today. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that we have a 90 day free trial. So uh, LT for biology covers four concepts, including enzyme action, photosynthesis and pH. And if you're interested in starting a free trial, which is 90 days, you can follow the link that's on this slide here. And I think that's it from me. Um, I'll be opening the floor to questions and please remember that you can ask questions of any of the three of the panelists. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions about LTE or the biology collection or other sensors that are used? I guess we nailed it. <laughs> There's a, lots of different sensors that are actually used. Um, in addition to CO2, O2 gas, pH, temp, uh, spectroscopy. Um, it really is amazing the amount of work that Charlotte has. And the, oh, I should say the whole content team is, I know I work mostly with Charlotte, but the content team is put into those panels. The, um, the sickle cell anemia lab is one that I used to do with my students almost uh, 20 years ago. So it's really amazing and great to see that that's been worked into the LT collection. And the histology slides are also um, amazing that those are in there for students to analyze. The thing to remember is if you have the sensors is that the LT can only be used with GoDirect sensors. It can't be used with our older BTA sensors. So it only works with sensors that have the, that are called GoDirect. So they look like this. They, um, and they have a USB cable here um, and they are this like teal color and gray color. The older ones that we have, sorry, they don't work with LT, but, but I, I really think this platform is an amazing uh, platform and collection. Looks like, John, we do have a question in our Q&A if you wanna handle that while I'm doing the poll. Yeah, I think it's a good question for um, Liam or Charlotte to answer is, does it integrate with other LMS systems? Does LT integrate with other LMS systems is the question. Uh, yes, so currently there are three um, LMSs that LT can natively integrate with. So that's Blackboard, Canvas, and Moodle. Moodle, not Moodle. Uh, and yeah, so I'm assuming that's what is meant by classroom management tools, but please let us know if you're meaning um, something different to yeah, LMSs. We also have an API as well. So if uh, those of you are a bit more tech savvy, um, yeah, there's an API that can allow for uh, more bespoke integration, so to say. So yeah, so I guess that if, let's say they're using Banner or Blackboard, there's a way to integrate that into it. Yep, and the integration, uh, it's for student accounts coming in uh, from the LMS. And so you don't have to worry about uh, importing CSVs, um, CSV files. So that can be all handled by the LMS. And then the grades, if you are doing assessments in LT, can be synced back to uh, the gradebook in Blackboard, Moodle, or Canvas. Uh, there's also uh, the option to get a unique link for a lesson, um, an LT lesson, and to put that uh, link directly in your LMS as well. So that way students don't have to navigate to um, the LT webpage and then log in and see it. They can yeah, be directed straight to the lesson um, yeah, from within LMS. If you have any questions for me about Vernier equipment, you can always email biology at vernier.com and that will get directed to me. All that you need to do is say, I have a question about LT and GoDirect sensors and 
I'll make sure that it gets to me or someone else that can answer that question. So once again, that's biology at vernier.com. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today.